No, not really. Anyhow, Philippians chapter 2 is our, uh, where we're at in our Bible studies. Philippians chapter 2, and we're about verse 10, 11, and that range there somewhere. Philippians chapter number 2. And book of Philippians now is not a heavy doctrinal book, but, uh, you know, sometimes people tend to pass things off real lightly because they're not uh, being loaded on uh, with uh, big-time doctrinal stuff. And you don't want to do that. Uh, you know, though Paul, uh, he loads you down other places, and it's like church here. Sometimes it's heavy, sometimes it's light. If I teach something that's heavy, I usually always try to back it up with something that's light and go back and forth. I learned that a long time ago. I remember one time I went to Baptist Temple, and Dr. Uckman was getting ready to deal with Daniel's 70th week. And uh, his pattern was this, and this, this would be the professional way of doing it. His pattern was he told some, you know, got things on the light side and told some stories that were on the light side and uh, come through real light, and all of a sudden he says, okay, we're ready to kick her off now. Went in Daniel's 70th week, which was real heavy stuff, hit it as hard as he could and as fast as he could, and come out the other side with a light story and lightened it up. And that's pretty well. People can't stand. You can't stand it all light. You can't stand it all heavy. So it's got to go back and forth. And uh, the Bible, of course, balanced. The Lord knows that, knows what to put on Paul's heart at the right time, the right place. And though Philippians is not real heavy, uh, yet you have, uh, you have some lessons to learn. You got your heavy stuff in Romans. You got your heavy stuff in uh, Ephesians. You got stuff like that. Plenty of stuff for you to work on doctrinally. Um, but you know, there's uh, two sides of the Christian life. We not only get it right, uh, but we do right. And uh, the Bible says you're not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. Uh, God wants to be doers of the word. Now, if I think about the big time stuff in Philippians. You know what I think about? I think about here's a fellow in adverse conditions. Here's a fellow up against it. Here's a fellow uh, in bonds. Here's a fellow in adversity. We'd call it, we'd call it persecution, suffering. We call it definitely an adverse situation. And yet this fellow talks about joy and rejoicing, joy and rejoicing, joy and rejoicing. You know what that is? That's big time stuff. You know something? If you can go through something, you can take it that way. You've attained a pretty high level of Christianity. Most people can't. Uh, you know, I'm, I myself, I find, I find great disappointment in myself a lot of times. I know what to do, I just don't always do it. Uh, sometimes I might come through and do it right, and, you know, other times I might be whipped on, and all of a sudden it dawns on me, man, you're not thinking straight. What are you doing? And then get things straightened up and go on. And, you know, this, this great lesson here, if somebody can, you know, take a few licks and take it on the chin and uh, go through a few things like Paul and come out chapter after chapter and time after time, just talk, well, there's a couple of verses here in chapter number two where, I mean, two straight verses, he's both the words, joy and rejoicing, joy and rejoicing. And it seemed like that's the big thing for him. As far as I can see, that's real important. Now, you know, you know what the opposite of that is? What's the opposite of joy? What's the opposite of rejoicing? Uh, you think about the other side of the coin. That's standard. That's the world's way of handing, handling adversity. Sometimes that's the Christian's way of handling adversity. Sometimes in our weaker moments, that's how we do it. But you know what to do, and you know how to do it, and you know what Paul saw. So, as far as I can see, may not be big time as far as the doctrine, but sure is big time uh, when it comes to the practical side of the Christian life. All right, and he talks about the Lord, and he talks about how the Lord comes in, talks about you and I, and how we're supposed to take a look at each other, and we're supposed to esteem other better than, our, than ourselves. We're supposed to look at one another, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And uh, we're supposed to have the feeling that uh, they're all right. I wish I was as good a Christian what they are. I wish I could handle myself as well as they do. And the Bible says lowliness of mind. Now, again, what's the opposite? High look, lofty look, proud, thinking they're nobody and I'm everything. And it's not really that way. If you was putting in identical boots, you probably wouldn't fare as well. 90% of the time, you wouldn't handle it as well. All right, and then, of course, the example comes on Lord. And Lord, about how he went all the way down to the bottom. All the way down to the bottom in every area. All the way to the bottom. Not only geographically, he came down from heaven all the way down here. Uh, as far as God coming down, became man, uh, became a servant. And through it all, he didn't get rebellious, didn't get disobedient. He didn't get argumentative and say, God, I came to do your will. And, Lord, I, I came with the right purpose and the right motive and the right mind. And, and God, look what's happened. He didn't do that. He was obedient and obedient unto the death of the cross. He went as low as anybody could possibly go, all the way to the bottom without being disobedient. You know what that is? That's, that's something. Made himself of no reputation, went all the way down, and then, of course, all the way out uh, on the cross. You know what God did? God took him because of that. And the Bible says he hath highly exalted him, given him a name 
uh, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, you know what's going to happen out in the future? Everybody that's ever stepped foot on this earth, they're going to give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to glorify that name. They're going to bow before that name. They're going to confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, for some, for the Christian, it'll be the judgment seat of Christ. There are some people get saved, and that's it, period. They get saved. And I'm glad they get saved. I mean, uh, you know, heaven sure beats hell. I'm glad they get saved. But it would be a whole lot better if Christians get saved and begin to, you know, inch their way ahead and begin to do right and keep on doing right and begin to gain on things. God wants you to keep going. God don't want you to go in reverse. God wants you to keep going. Some people go faster than others. Some people are slow. It doesn't matter the speed. It just matters that you get there. God knows that. The Christian race and the pace by which you travel, that's up to him. That's up to him. The, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And that Bible talks about run the race with patience. He's the author and finisher of our faith. It just matters that you keep on going. I've seen some people, uh, some people that get married in two years' time, they got a home. They got their own home. Some people get married and ten years, uh, they may not have it. But t- they've, they've done everything right. They've put God first. They've inched ahead and down the road somewhere. Uh, God honors that and they get their own home. It doesn't matter. It just matters that you do right. I mean, Christian life. You don't have to leap out ahead. Some leap ahead, and then before you know it, that's it. They're just like a shooting star. Mine's all burnt out, and that's it. But I tell you what, the uh, Lord wants you to keep on going. Now, you take the Lord. He was, he, was, he was obedient, obedient, even unto death, in the death of the cross. That's something. That's something. Now, that Bible says that yonder, of course, it'll be white throne of judgment for lost people, Judgment seat of Christ for saved people on the other side of the rapture. But one day, every knee shall bow. You know what? A whole lot better and a whole lot sweeter to bow right now. I mean, it's a sweet thing just to get down before the Lord and say, Lord, here I am again. Dumb, dumb. No good. God, just trying to stay in fellowship with you. God, trying to get back in fellowship with you. God, trying to do a couple things right. You know, just down before the Lord. Just kind of a heart-to-heart talk between you and the Lord. Sure is good that way, isn't it? Sure is better that way. And to go on with broken fellowship and just kind of, yeah, he's my Savior. And, you know, just kind of if because maybe something you've been asked to do, you haven't been willing to do it or whatever. One day, every knee shall bow. You see Christians won't do it now. You see Christians get hardened, get out of the race, fall out of the race. They ain't going to do it. They're not about to do it. They will one day. They're going to bow. Every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess uh, to God that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All right, number 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only. Now, Paul's, Paul, you know, he's talking. I, uh, hopefully it's true that uh, what they do in front of him, they do when he's not around. They're not just, you know, good Christians on Sunday. Uh, they're good Christians every day of the week. They're not just, you know, uh, great, pious people when they're in church. They're great, pious people when they're out of church. When they're in the home, they're great, pious people. Oh, uh, it says, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. All right, I'm gone. I can't even be around you. Much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this verse here is a famous Methodist verse. And uh, the old-fashioned Methodists, you know, especially the free Methodists, some of those kind of people. Uh, those people take this passage here, and they talk about, uh, you know, that everything you do, you just about got to do it with uh, fear. Everything you do, you got about got to do it with tears in your eyes. And I guess the final deduction comes in some cases where people think that you never really got saved. You didn't get you a good old-fashioned dose of salvation unless you hit the altar with tears in your eyes. And that's not necessarily true. Sometimes people do. Sometimes people come out of the pits and the dregs of sin. Uh, Sometimes they've wallowed around that stuff for a long time, and sometimes their heart's just broken 150 different ways. And sometimes they hit the altar, maybe under certain conditions. Uh, They might do that. But you take uh, take a six-, seven-year-old kid, been exposed to what these kids are exposed to in Sunday school. God deals with their heart at young and tender age. They haven't seen all of that and hope they never see it. They don't have to see that side of uh, the wicked world to get saved. All the God knows that my little old white lie and my little old mischievous stuff that everybody thought was cute uh, happens to be sin. And that sin needs forgiven. And they can get saved. That doesn't necessarily mean that the only way they can get saved is with tears in their eyes. I remember one time Brother Max Keel was preaching down in the basement of the home. We had church in the house. And Max, he's bringing some lessons, I think it was on Joshua. And uh, we had some real good Wednesday night services there. And Max taught a, 
I don't know, a series of four or five lessons there. And I remember one night, a uh, uh, family that came to the church brought some visitors in. And uh, I believe the lady was in the nursery, which would have been another room in the basement. I forget exactly how that was now, but anyhow, somebody she brought, and Max preached and gave the invitation, they got saved. And the first word she said to me was, did they have tears in their eyes? Well, that's not the measure of whether you got saved or not. I mean, I don't recall whether they had tears in their eyes or didn't have tears in their eyes. Nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't have to be that way. But you see, sometimes people kind of get stretching things a little bit beyond uh, what the Word of God really has in it. All right, it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. All right, now, number one, you don't work out something unless it's on the inside. It's kind of, you know, from the inside out. Salvation is not an outside-in thing. That's what the Pharisees tried for. You know, the Pharisees, they got everything like a white and sepulcher, and they're like a whitewashed bunch of people, and they had the outside, I mean, doctored up, painted up, veneered up, shined up, cleaned up, washed up, uh, de, uh, disinfected, you name it, brother. They were about as clean as anybody could do. Uh, they had the, you know, washing of pots and cups, and they had traditions and everything else alongside the Word of God. They were clean, but Jesus Christ condemned them because of just an outward thing. And salvation is inward and of the heart. See? So it starts on the inside, and then what's inside is supposed to work its way out, eventually come out. And it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, again, not a statement where somebody has to, you know, tremble all the time. But it's a thing whereby you wouldn't want to cross the Word of God. You fear to cross the Word of God. You fear God too much too much to give yourself uh, too many strings that way. All right, work out your own salvation uh, with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh, notice, in you, in you. All right, it's either outward or inward, and salvation begins on the inside. It's God who does the work on the inside. It's God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All right, then the Lord keeps on working, keeps on working, keeps on working, because God wants you to do things that are pleasing to him. And sometimes he's got to put a little more pressure on. Sometimes he's got to work a little harder. Sometimes he's got to uh, put you under uh, a couple uh, maybe extreme situations. But it's God that worketh in you. All right. Uh, uh, verse number 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, Christians need to memorize that because, you know, sometimes we, sometimes we get in a rut. And sometimes in that rut we get in a... We pick up a habit, a real bad habit, and the bad habit is that of complaining. And the complaining, the Bible says back in the book of Numbers, it says when the children of Israel complained, it, it, uh, it displeased the Lord. The Lord was not pleased with that kind of thing. And they didn't just complain, but they had that low, sullen form of uh, complaining, that kind of undertone type of thing uh, known as murmuring. And they were murmuring. They were notorious for it. And it was a heavy payday for it. They paid for it. I mean, think about sins that cost some people sin unto death. That's one of the ones that cost them. Take your Bible and go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at, oh, make it about verse 5 all the way through verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10. And look at verse 5. 1 Corinthians 10, 5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What's one of the big problems? We'll keep reading. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. There's one problem. Neither, neither be ye idolaters, there's another. As were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, there's another one. As some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Nine. Neither let us tempt Christ as some, there's another one. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. And ten, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them, for examples, they're written for our admonition upon whom, the, and upon whom the ends of the world are come. All right, then something for you and I to learn from, listen to the word of God. Great problem with Israel, not just fornication, not just tempting God, not just lusting, uh, but... That passage talks about murmuring. Now go back to Exodus chapter 17. 16. Make it 16. Exodus chapter 16. And you'll find that Paul never stretched a thing here. Exodus chapter 16.
All right, Exodus chapter, well, hang on a second. Study not so many Bibles for where he is at. All King James Bibles, by the way. Uh, I'm not like some of these dudes that talk about I do my studying out of those other Bibles and get up and use the King James Bible. I do my studying from King James Bible. Right, Exodus chapter 16, verse number 3. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. I right, look at verse number 7. And in the morning that ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for he that heareth your murmurings against the Lord, and what are we that ye murmur against us? Verse 8, down in the middle of the verse, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us. Number 9, come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. Verse number 12, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. The Lord is, the Lord's not pleased with that kind of thing. Matter of fact, uh, chapter 17, verse number 3, uh, the people murmured against Moses and said, what, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And uh, that was just kind of par for the course. These people were very unhappy people, uh, very complaining, griping people. And if you stop and think in time where you're at, I mean, you're a couple months after God gave a miraculous deliverance of the Red Sea, and here they are, uh, griping, complaining again, murmuring. And the Bible says to the Christian, very basic and very, very plain, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Not a matter of why don't I have to do it like little kids do with the mom, and why doesn't he do it, and why doesn't somebody else do the dishes, why don't I have to do them all the time, and why don't I have to wash them, why can't I dry them, and uh, you know, always that, you know, a little bit of a problem, never satisfied with your lot in life. All right, number 15, that you may be blameless and harmless. All right, in the sense of murmuring, blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. All right, then the Lord wants you to, Lord wants you along some lines. I mean, you're not going to be perfectly sinless, and you're not going to be, you know, have everything 100% right, but in this area, you can have it right. In this area, you don't have to go down. In this area, you can be blameless. It'll be like the office of a deacon, the office of a bishop, found back in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Use the office blameless. And not that somebody's sinless, but along certain areas, the use of the office, they can be blameless. And this area here, the Christian can be blameless. The sons of God without rebuke. Uh, there's no comeback, no recourse. Uh, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Uh, Jesus Christ said, let your light so shine before men that others may see and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He's the light of the world. I am the light of the world, and you and I, we're just kind of a reflector of that light. He's inside of you, and you can't, you know, do much but uh, let it shine, and it says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Number 16, holding forth the word of life. All right, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. But right, the idea is this, the judgment seat of Christ, uh, the time that Paul has spent with him, what he's taught him, the word of God, uh, the Bible that he's given unto him, uh, was not in vain. I mean, uh, the time was used wisely. Uh, he put it on them. They put it on somebody else. And he says that uh, I may rejoice in the day of Christ. And what I've given to you, and what I've gone through to give it to you, and the price that I've paid to get it to you, I have not run in vain. And sometimes it appears that way, but it is not. And he says, it would sure be good to hit, uh, to hit the judgment uh, seat of Christ and know that when I get out there, uh, that, brother, you have done something with what you've got. Now, you take just as I can imagine how Paul felt. I'm a pastor. And, of course, he was, you know, his, his ministry wasn't confined like mine is confined pretty well to one area. Uh, but I can get some idea of how it feels because, you know what, it sure is, it sure is good and it sure is a blessing to know that people are, they want what you got. They're grabbing for what you got. They're uh, doing something with what you give to them. Uh, the word of God is going on. And uh, Paul says here, he says, I, you know, I'm not out to spin some wheels. I don't want to run in vain. I don't want to just, you know, sit there and, you know, leave a bunch of tracks. I want to, I want to. I want those wheels, brother, to take hold and go. I want something to be done with it. And he says, if that takes place, he said, I'm going to get out there. And he says, I will rejoice that I have not run in vain. Now, Christian, sometimes you don't see the results immediately. And sometimes it appears like the devil will tell you work is in vain. And sometimes you feel like, you know, that uh, what's the use? And sometimes you feel like, why pursue things and why go on? But remember this, it is never in vain. Uh, there was one time about two or three weeks ago, there wasn't very many of us out in canvassing on Tuesday night, and we went out, and it uh, wasn't the fact of uh, not very many out, but not only that, there weren't very many home. 
It's something like going down a street corner in the middle of July. They're all to a swimming pool. There ain't nobody down time. Nobody down much anyhow. Uh, but you can imagine just the distinction between that and 90-degree weather, man, with an air conditioner and a swimming pool. And this was kind of one of those nights. And it was just a real hot Tuesday night, and we're out there. And, man, I went up down 26, 27th Street, Warwick Place, one of those streets over there. We went up, you know, walked up that hill and down around St. Elmo and down the other way in St. Elmo, back down the hill there. And I'll tell you what, man, for the whole evening, two hours, it must have been three-fourths of those homes was no show. And, I mean, it'd be locked up tight, and there wasn't no evidence of any movement around. It wasn't somebody, you know, hurry up, you know, you know, let's all be real quiet, you know, and hush things up because somebody's at the door. It wasn't one of those things. They were gone. And it was no show, no show, no show. You know what the Lord impressed upon me? The Lord impressed upon me that when I can't do it, the Lord just used another method. And I, we left gospel literature at every home and the importance of those gospel tracts. And you know what I come to the conclusion there? I come to the conclusion my labor still wasn't in vain. I didn't accomplish what I'd hoped to. I didn't get chances to witness I'd hoped for. Uh, I didn't see anything happen like I wanted to happen. But I come to the conclusion my labor is not in vain the Lord. It's just the Lord had to use the gospel tracts and use a different method a little later in the day to get the job done. But sometimes you feel like it's in vain. Now the best thing is whenever people take what you have, and what you give them, what you put out, and dish it out, and they take that thing and go with it and try to accomplish something with it. That's what really stirs uh, the preacher man. Already he had a real good desire, and his desire was he not only wanted to win someone to the Lord, he wanted to win someone to the Lord and then try to get them going and see them win somebody else to the Lord. You know what that is? That's a good desire. Something kind of like this right here. It's a thing where, you know, I've won you to the Lord. You've you're, you're got that part settled here. Uh, now I like to see things keep on going, see so you stay on track. And uh, my effort and the work that I've uh, put into your Christian life, that I have not labored in vain, have not run in vain. All right, verse number 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Now you think about what he just said. He said, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, if I pay the price, if there's a sacrifice involved, if I'm no more than your servant, he said, I joy and rejoice with you all. It's not like here's, here I am, the great apostle Paul. Here I am, an abundance of revelations. Uh, here I am, I mean, I mean, I got the uh, mystery of the dispensation of the grace of God, I mean, that God revealed to me for anybody else. I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got the doctrine for 2,000 years of church age. Here I am, the great, uh, great Christian, the great apostle Paul, and I want you to sacrifice yourself for me and be my servant. Just the reverse. Here I am, your servant, in your service, for you. Here I am, paying the price. Here I am, the one doing the sacrificing. And he said, you do something with it? And he said, I'll still rejoice and I'll still be filled with with joy. For the same cause also ye joy and rejoice with me. Oh, two times and two verses. There it is. Joy and rejoice. You've read it time and time again. Time for us to get the message. 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. Oh, I said it would be a blessing to me if when I hear about you and uh, Timothy brings a report back to me and I hear how things are going. I said, Understand, you know, the difference between your standing and your state. In Jesus Christ, everything fine and dandy. But your state, so I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about right now. I'm concerned about your Christianity and your level of Christianity. And he said, it'll be a blessing if when Timothy gets around you and Timothy comes back and brings a report to me, uh, that's the right kind of report. He says, that'll be a real blessing to me. And he says, it'll uh, be a good comfort to me, to comfort my heart when I know your state. I look at verse 12, back at verse 12. He says, not only in my presence, not as my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He says, uh, what goes on when I'm there, not there, same thing. Uh, things are being done, and they're being done right. Number 20, for I have no man like-minded. Now, reference to Timotheus, Timothy. I have no man like-minded who will naturally, naturally care for your state. Now, you know what he writes those pastoral, they call them pastoral epistles? First and Second Timothy, Titus, that type of thing. All right, why? Because Timothy has the characteristics, uh, the natural characteristics of the type of fellow to be make a good pastor. And one of the major, you know, I mean, there are several things listed back there: hospitality, 
have to teach patient and different things. Uh, but one of the major things is here, naturally care for your state. Not a hard thing. It's not a duty, an obligation. It's just natural for him. He's tender enough that he cares. He's concerned about you. He sort of analyzes when things are not quite up to snuff. He can sort of sense when perhaps you're dragging a little bit. Uh, it's just a natural thing for him to care for you. And he says it's in, in distinction for most. The standard thing is we care only for ourselves. He talks about in the next, all verse 21 there. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Most of the time, we're concerned just about ourselves. You know what God wants you and I to do? God wants you and I to get concerned about others. Have you been? Who? How long ago? You concerned about others? Timothy just had a natural thing about him that he, he had concern. Wasn't manufactured, wasn't put on, wasn't unnatural, natural. That's just his nature. I tell you one thing, that's part of his divine nature. Because naturally speaking, the old man, the old nature, going to be concerned about number one, period. All right, qualifications. Everybody talks about, you know, this quality and that quality. What about that one? All right, number 22. For you know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. And that father and son relationship. Uh, he talked about that thing uh, back in the first time. He talked about my son in the faith. All right, he tried to instruct him, bring him along, help him along. I uh, served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself also shall come shortly thinking that in due time, before too awful long, I'll shake these bonds here and I'll be out of jail and I'll be able to come as well myself. It'll be great to just be around you. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Well, I know somebody else that concerned about Paul ministered to my wants. But it says companion in labor. Well, I not uh, whatever there was to do, it did not make any difference. Uh, the jobs didn't have to be easy jobs. Whatever was out there, companion labor. All right, it didn't have to be an easy cake uh, walk or a cake-eating situation. A fellow soldier and willing to endure hardness, a good soldier, the Lord Jesus Christ. And your messenger, but your messenger. All right, take the word to them. And he that ministered to my one. So Epaphroditus looked like he's quite a fellow. Looks like he's quite the guy. Now go back to Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, notice other things. Notice about verse 6 and 7. Romans 16, verse number 7. Yeah, Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. And then 6 and 7. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, also were in Christ before me. All it talks about fellow soldier. Talks about fellow labor. Talks about uh, fellow prisoner in Romans chapter 16. And Paul Paul implies that I'm just, I'm one of the gang, that's all. I'm just another guy in the fight. I'm just another soldier in the battle. I'm not big old general so-and-so. I'm not big tough top dog. I'm just another fellow in the battle. You know, sometimes people, they get out of kilter. Sometimes they get in balance. Sometimes Bible-believing people get out of balance. I get all kinds of periodicals come around here, and I don't know how the, my name ever gets on the list or where they come from, but, uh, man, it's amazing the stuff that comes. And here recently, this about probably the fourth or fifth one I got from a church down in Texas. And this church down in Texas had a big old soul winning conference. The source had all the names there. And they had pictures of this great, super fantastic meeting that they had of 1988 or 89, whatever the more recent one was. And they were showing pictures of, you know, this guy and that guy and Dr. Jack Kyle's and Dr. Tom Malone and, you know, that type of fellow. And I looked at the next picture there and it said, and it was a lady that said doctor and it had the lady's name. And I thought to myself, what is going on? What are we doing? Have we gone insane? What is this stuff? I mean, this doctor, that doctor, another one, everybody confers one on another guy and this guy confers one on him and somebody confers one on him and now we've gone to the women? Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. 
I heard about one of them situations. In one of them situations there, they had to, uh, they were giving doctors, you know, to this guy and that guy. And finally, the state came in, kind of fussed about that thing. Said, man, <laughs> this doctor, man, you're belittling anybody that's done any work for it. And, uh, and so they kind of backed away from it, and they changed the term from doctor, this was the preacher's name. They changed it from doctor to general, or colonel, or lieutenant, or whatever. That sounds like the mafia, you know? I mean, when I, what I see in the Word of God, brother, we're just, I'm just another man in the battle. I happen to be the pastor here. I'm another fellow in a battle, that's all. Fellow soldier, fellow prisoner, fellow laborer. Something to do? I'll do it just like you. I don't ask to do something I don't do. I'll do it. I can't do it all. There's only one of me. Sometimes wish there's two. There's only one. Like yourself, you got more to do than you can do too. I'll do some of it. You do some of it. Uh, We're just a team. We're just a a bunch of people gathered together, band together, going to stay together and try to accomplish what we can together. Till Jesus Christ comes back. And forget the titles. Forget this. Uh, I remember one time when I first got saved, I thought, well, I don't know what to call the preacher. I heard him called reverend. I heard him called doctor. I heard him called brother. And I heard him called by his first name. And, you know, I just didn't know anything. And I went up and, to one of those uh, assistants there and I said, what do I call him? <laughs> and I said, well, I mean... Really, what are they? You know what I am? I'm your brother. You know what she is? She's my sister. See? We're just brothers and sisters. We're members of the same family. We're supposed to be in fellowship. Two fellows in, a, in the ship, man. We're, we're going to glory together. And we're fellow soldiers. It's not that we're battling each other. You know, sometimes I think we just about miss who the enemy is. Didn't Paul say back there in Ephesians chapter 6, I mean, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Sometimes we miss the real enemy. And sometimes we miss on a whole lot of other areas as well. Number 26 says, For he longed after you all was full of heaviness. Uh, Paul is the same way. Paul talked that way about the Israelites. And talked about heaviness in Romans chapter 9, two, three, or four verses there. He got talking that way. He says, Was full of heaviness because that she had heard that he had been sick. Now, not that he got off into sin, you heard something about him, but he had been sick. It's like he didn't want to burden somebody down. And uh, it's because they sort of knew how it was. For indeed he was sick, he bad sick, nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Now, it's apparent here, this fellow is a top notcher. Uh, If you look at uh, what he's described at one, two, three, four... Five, five good things said about this guy in one verse. It's apparent that Epaphroditus, he's the real thing. It's apparent this guy, is, he's top notch all the way. And yet even someone like that, look what happened. That fellow got sick. That fellow got very sick. That fellow nearly died. You know, that's kind of strange to the, some of what's out there. Some of what's out there is that, you know, any time somebody gets sick, judgment of God on them. And so anybody gets sick and doesn't get well... Uh, they're not claiming the atonement. And here's a fellow that, uh, I mean, as far as uh, this sickness is not because of sin, brother, it's for the glory of God. This guy right here, as uh, far as I can see, uh, he was bad sick and he hadn't done anything wrong. He'd done a lot of things right and he was bad sick. And it's apparent that not everybody that's sick is going to get healed. Sometimes they get sick and die. Sometimes they get sick and almost die, but don't. And you and I have got to keep our thinking on straight. And sometimes they get sick, real bad sick. It's not because of any sin. And sometimes they get sick, it is because of sin. John chapter 5, the indication is because of sin. But you and I have got to keep, uh, you've got to keep your thinking cap on straight. All right, now take your Bible and go back to, oh, make it First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. 23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. 
Paul's talking about somebody getting, well, just like you and I. I went and paid a visit to Woody and Gertie, and we got talking about, you know, arthritis, bursitis, and stuff like that. And we got talking about Motrin and Faldine and I don't know, all that kind of stuff like that. And, and uh, cod liver oil. And talking about, you know, caffeine, no caffeine. Got talking about some things that work. That's just stuff like you and I. Drink no longer water, use a little wine for that stomach's sake, and then off infirmities. That's not talking about running off to some healer and getting your hand, somebody's hands laid on you. Not talking about getting slain in the spirit and uh, getting revived and being healed and everything else. Uh, just talking about the same type of thing as you and I. Why is that? Uh, ordinarily, Paul, Paul never used those kind of methods. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and this time look at verse number 20. 2 Timothy 4, 20. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at my lead him sick. That's kind of an unusual thing. That's like you and I. Some get well, some don't get well. Uh, here's a situation here where he goes on and he says, uh, I left a fellow behind, a guy is sick. Left him behind sick. He was mad at him. No, he wasn't mad at him. He didn't want him to get well. He didn't have no faith. None of that stuff. It's just that what you find early in Paul's ministry has now diminished because God's ministry to the Jews has changed. Things have changed. And as that thing, the Jews fade out of the picture there and God begins to deal with the Gentiles, Paul's uh, ministry that included signs began to diminish as well. And so he gets talking about try this. Try a little wine. New wine. Try a little wine for your stomach's sake. And then often infirmities. What doesn't do it? This might do it. Uh, he gets talking about try a physician. Look at chapter 4, verse number 11. Same as you and I. Only Luke. Luke, he's a beloved physician. Only Luke is with me. You know, he's operating just like you and I. Verse number 20, he's operating like you and I. Uh, sometimes you don't like to do it and you hate to see him sick and you wish you could do something for him. And yet you go on and brother, they're still sick. I like, you know, I like to go and do something for Peggy and have her leap out of that bed and uh, take her in my car and take her on home and everything's fine and dandy and, you know, well ever after. But you know what? I've got to leave Altman Hospital a lot of times, and I leave her there just like she was when I came in. Maybe encouraged inside a little bit from the Word of God. I don't like that. But you know what? I mean, I understand what the ministry is right now. Sometimes some things work, and sometimes they don't. Go back to Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, look at verse 11 and 12. Paul's not mad at anybody. He's not trying to be uh, sadistic and see somebody suffer. He don't like anybody to be hurt. It's just that the miracles by his hands have diminished. And so now we go another route, the same route that you and I are forced to take. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. By the way, Christian, try to help each other out. Every now and then you may know of something. I may know of something. I may hear of something. Uh, it might be something that might be a blessing or benefit to somebody. I think of the infirmities I've had over the years, and I guess probably in the last 10 years, most of what has happened to me on the plus side that way has been because of some help by way of reference of a brother or sister in the Lord. I mean, I had a doctor wanting to do back surgery on me. I've never had it. I mean, I'm playing golf. I'm playing golf for the full turn. And I think tomorrow, good and hot, I'll take, I'll over, I'll over swing on the back. I mean, you know why? Because a sister in the Lord said, hey, I know somebody can fix you up. And if you know something, not that you know, I understand you've got five people telling you five different things. You can't do it all, but you can listen. And there may be somebody has some help for you. And that's all that was, went on here. All right, before that, a little bit different. Acts 19, verse 11. And God wrought, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. That's an amazing thing, but that doesn't happen all the time. Those were special miracles, a special time when Paul's ministry included a special people. And those people said no to Peter. They said no to Paul. They said no to John the Baptist, said no to the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, the Lord said no to them. Ye judge yourselves on where they have everlasting life. Lo, we go unto the Gentiles. And went unto the Gentiles and said, okay, these people, all they need to do is hear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They need to hear, and we'll send a messenger unto them. They don't need signs and miracles for uh, those people to believe. And so Paul's ministry then diminishes, and he says, uh, try a doctor. I got one. Take him with me all the time. Try a little new wine instead of some water. That might help your stomach. Get the thing working, get things circulating. Might, that might work that way. He said, uh, might just be a matter of praying. I have nothing I can do. I had to go on and couldn't do anything for him. 
But it's apparent that sometimes good, outstanding Christians get sick and do not get well. And sometimes they get well. And you pray and you pray and you pray. And you leave it what? Exactly like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The Bible says he was sick unto death. Uh, but he got, God had mercy upon him. Paul said, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the, that the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice. And that I may be the less sorrowful. All right, Paul, he's, he was, uh, it was a blessing to him. Just know that others were rejoicing. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. And hold such in reputation. All right, why wouldn't you? The fellow is a laborer. He's a soldier. He's a messenger. He ministers to somebody's wants. He's a good brother. Why wouldn't you hold such a reputation? Because for the work of Christ, he was not, he about did himself in. He about did himself in. You know what you do? You come in and make yourself of no reputation. You know what you do? You sacrifice and be offered on the service of others. You know what you do? You labor. You go on. Uh, you're a, a blessing to others. You minister to their wants. You help out where you can help out. And the Bible says in due time, you'll be held in reputation. All right, uh, verse 30, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto just about laid it down, nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. What you couldn't do, what you was unable to do, uh, he did his best uh, for me. Now, you know what Paul shows here? Paul shows that no matter what, no matter what the situation, no matter what befalls me, Paul shows a great measure of contentment. He talks about in chapter 4, whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I've learned something. I've learned when things is going good, praise the Lord. When things are not going good, I'm not going to murmur. And I'm not going to drag around, why did this happen to me? Why did I get sick? Why did he get sick? Why are they sick? Why did my family sick? Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. When things don't go well, I'm still going to be content. Whatsoever state I am. Paul says, uh... Godliness with contentment is great gain. Having food and raiment, lest therewith be content. We don't have anything to be discontented about. You've had breakfast. If you don't have breakfast, you're going to get dinner. You haven't had breakfast because you didn't want breakfast. Food and raiment, every one of you. You got shirt on your back. You got clothes on your back. Shoes on your feet. Don't like shoes on your feet, but you got them on for now. And, uh, you know, our sign out there, it's an invisible sign, uh, says no Shoes, no shirt, no service. <laughs> that what they say? <laughs> so you got your shoes and you got your shirt, and how about some contentment? Now, looking at the, looking at the chapter here, here's a man who had no pride, the Lord. Here's a man who came out with the greatest name in the universe. I mean, name above every name, Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a verse here in verse 12, verse number 13 says, uh, it's got to be in before it comes out. It not connect with your salvation. It's what's in there is to be evidence on the outside. Uh, it's evident from verse 25 that I guess a real Christian, a top-notch Christian, is in a battle. Christianity is a warfare. Fellow, so it's not a game you play. It's not tiddlywinks, friend. It's a warfare. And it's evident as well that sometimes godly Christians get sick, and sometimes they get well, and sometimes they don't. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful now for the word of God, and we're thankful, Lord, that even a book like this where the doctrine is not heavy, we're thankful, Lord, there's major things that we need to learn. Lord, it's uh, apparent from the theme of this book that what we need to learn is to be a joyful bunch of people, to rejoice even in, even in adversity, God, I'm sure that we need to learn not to murmur, gripe, argue, and fuss. May we learn it very well. In Jesus' name I pray and ask it. Amen. Okay, take a little break now. I'd like for you to stay for the preaching. It'll be from Proverbs chapter 27.